I didn't know what I was supposed to expect. Wendover, Utah appeared to me when I got there as the ideal location. Isolated out on the Nevada state line, on the salt flats of Utah, and uh, there wasn't very much there. There was nothing to attract any particular attention out there. And I thought, this 
this is the place I want to be. It would be easy to keep the secrets in the window. Nobody ever mentioned the word nuclear, nobody ever mentioned the word atomic. We just knew it was going to be a big explosion, uh, a lot of destructive force. During the bomb uh, run and test, we're trying to get the ballistics for the two weapons, for the airspeed, you'd have to put in a different trip, you'd have to put in a different uh, trail, which is uh, how far the bomb, where it comes out behind the airplane. But it took me, uh, I'd say, two to three months, the background I had, to actually uh, realize and believe that they were actually uh, onto something as big as I'd heard. So in my background, it's hard for me to visualize that one bomb could do what they said. Him being all of their military equipment to resist an invasion. We were given uh, information about air sea rescue units and uh, what we uh, uh, would do in case of trouble with the bomb, trouble with the airplane, uh, trouble from enemy action. Had the final briefing at uh, at midnight, followed by then the breakfast and down to the flight line. You knew it was big. You know, it was a, it was going to be a big one, and so you were. Uh, oh, I think. Uh, you were at a level a little higher than you do on a conventional mission. The uh, biggest part of that after the briefing was coming out to the aircraft and seeing this tremendous amount of people around it, uh, clean lights with uh, shining all over the airplane, uh, a big crowd of people out there. You, know, you were the center of attention. You were the monkeys in the zoo. And I was sitting there with it in the seat ready to start engines. And of course, uh, some of the cameras were still out there. And I stuck my head out to ask them, please move, move the cameras and the, the floodlights and all that so we could start cranking up. And at the same time, somebody yelled at me and said, hey, wave at us. I had a bunch of lives on board this airplane that I had to give careful consideration to. And in that regard, I couldn't help but reflect on Chaplain Downey's prayer. We pray the, the end of the war may come soon, and that once more we may know peace on earth. May the men who fly this night be kept safe in thy care, and may they be returned safely to us. We shall go forward trusting in thee, knowing that we are in thy care now and forever. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Now watch the airspeed indicator go past 160 that night. And we were still on the ground, those wheels were turning. But I was confident that this was the only way to do it so that I could control with the tail if I had to. So, when I'm going down there and I kept it past that magic 140 that he knew it was used to, he started to grab the yoke and pull back on it. He said, lift it off. And I told him, I said, keep your damn hands off of that yoke. I'm flying this airplane. Weather was very clear. We could see and uh, it was in the bombardier's hands at that point. Well, after flying as much as I had in Europe and planning missions from the very start, uh, I knew a lot about picking up aiming points. It's something that I, I could pick up at the bombardier real easy. And that uh, the bridge that I picked out was right in the city. It made an ideal aiming point. And then, for five minutes, I was watching his head there, and he was looking at me and chewing on his cigar. And he said, ain't a damn thing I can do. Nothing. It's going right down the track. And he's looked up at the bomb site. It's on course. And it was on course until it left the airplane. All I raised up little and looked up right out over the nose. And Paul immediately started to turn. But I could still see it. But I wanted to make sure it was clear of the aircraft. But I had some trouble with some of that tumble here that I was uh, when I was the window dropped over. So I wanted to make sure it was falling clear. And it was. It was going straight in. We were still pretty close to it, and so much from the cloud. It 
showed the fog rising to about all level, uh, which was a neighborhood of 33,000 feet, if I remember right. And uh, it also showed the turbulence engulfing the city and moving out into the foothills. And the only thing that I could see of Hiroshima was one of the docks and the bay. Colonel Tibbetts, will you tell us some of your reactions over the target? Well, as the bomb left the airplane, we took over uh, manual control, made an extremely steep turn to try and put as much distance between ourselves and the explosion as possible. After we uh, felt the uh, explosion hit the airplane, that is the concussion waves, uh, we knew that the bomb had exploded, everything was a success, so we turned around to take a look at it. The sight that greeted our eyes was quite uh, beyond what we had expected because we saw this cloud of boiling dust and debris below us with this tremendous mushroom on top. Uh, beneath that was hidden the ruins of the city of Hiroshima. When we came back, we knew that war was over. There was no way that war was going on. What we saw had happened, but they would not admit to the fact. Uh, they didn't admit to Hiroshima. Uh, they finally admitted to Nagasaki, but even after they gave up, ceded, they didn't. They didn't show any overt acts to stop the war. So it was necessary to have two bombs, and I think that uh, we back on the ground that didn't fly the second mission were pretty doggone proud of that group of people too. Colonel Tibbetts, will you tell us some of your reactions? I think uh, you have to say that you wish the war could have ended uh, without flying missions of this type, but in the long run, I'm thoroughly convinced that the use of, the, of the, uh, this weapon did shorten the war and save lives overall, both uh, Allied lives and Japanese lives. Because uh, if you look, if you play what if, and you say what would have happened uh, if the bomb had not been dropped, and you start looking at, you know, firebombs would have continued, uh, even without an invasion, uh, the, the casualties would have been very, very heavy. War is bad, horrible, and uh, even in, in Europe, uh, my intention over there is the same thing as Hiroshima, to help get the war over, to end the killing. It's a devastating thing, it came as a tremendous surprise, uh, it shocked people. If people could see the attitude that we have, the patriotism we had at the time, the sincerity of our beliefs today, I wanted to do everything that I could to subdue Japan. That was the attitude of the United States in those years. That 509th Composite Group was a great group of patriotic men. They all put their backs to the wheel, and we succeeded in bringing that carnage to an end, and everybody got to go home.